How you doing, Kevin? I'm doing great. How you doing, John? Good, good, man. Um, wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, what you got or what, what you in particular have been doing this off season. I know you can't go into the facility and you know, kind of where have you been uh, working out uh, in general? And, and then also, what do you think the impact of, uh, of not, you know, having OTAs and, you know, possibly mini camp, that kind of thing, what kind of impact will, will that have on a team? Yeah. So, I mean, this off season, I've been enjoying my time, with my family, uh, my daughter, she's, She's growing bigger and bigger every single day. She's so smart. Uh, it's been enjoying time with family. Uh, obviously, in the beginning of the off season, probably like middle of February, I started training. Out, I started training my trainer, uh, Jason Spray, like I always do every off season. I mean, obviously, once the coronavirus uh, thing kind of heated up, uh, obviously, I started uh, standing in the house. Uh, I actually had bought my wife a Peloton bike uh, during the season last year uh, that she was using after she had the baby. Uh, but that ended up turning out to be probably the best investment I made this entire offseason because I've been using it all the time. And um, I know it's been on back order. I have a lot of guys been hitting me up saying I can't get one. It's been on back order since February, since March. So I'm glad I have one. So, But uh, as of late, I have been uh, trying to get back out with my trainer, of course, making sure that we're still, you know, trying to social distance. But I have been training with him as well on a, on a private basis. I have a couple of guys on the team that's training with me as well. So. Uh, just not having this, 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 the OTAs and not actually being in the building, being in the facility, I think it, it would impact teams that don't take advantage of, you know, the, the virtual meetings and things like that. Because we have a veteran group. I think pretty much everybody that's in our meetings right now, you know, excluding Logan Ryan, uh, has, has we played together. So as far as us being on the field, obviously those reps are valuable. But uh, the fact that we're all speaking the same language already up to this point, we're kind of just sharpening on some communication uh, things like that. So uh, I think we're just going to try to make the best out of opportunity for the best of, you know, the situation that we have. So I don't think, you know, it'll it'll affect us, at least in our secondary as much. But of course, we're going to try to hold everybody accountable and just try to make sure and reaching out to all the guys and make sure, you know, they're keeping up with their stuff. Teron, you have a question? Yeah, KB, hope everything is well. Uh, my question is, with, with the loss of uh, Dean Pease, how, how does that impact the defense? And you specifically is, is one of the guys that's a step up as a leader. Yeah, for sure. What's going on, TD? Uh, it's, 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 it's definitely a huge loss. I mean, Dean Pease, obviously one of the greatest defensive coordinators to ever coach this game. I mean, Dick LeBar, I've been blessed to be coached by both of them. Um, so it's definitely going to be a huge loss, especially uh, just the meetings, just the, you know, the stories, the talks that Dean used to always be able to uh, share with us. He always spent a lot of time in our DB room. So whenever we had questions, it was always easy to get our, those questions answered. But uh, having Vrabel and, and obviously Vrabel coming under Dean P's tree, uh, them speaking the same language, them kind of having the similar philosophies, I don't think uh, – you know, philosophy wise is our defense is going to change that much. So that's going to be good for us, especially going into, you know, season not actually being able to have those OTAs. So it will be a loss. But at the same time, uh, the fact that we still have we still have the same coaching staff. Uh, I think that will help us tremendously in, in a time like this. Uh, Teresa Walker. Uh, Kevin, uh, glad that you're doing OK. Uh, the virtual off-season program started yesterday. What was that like and uh, how how different, how much of a growing experience is it? And, and then secondly, how much does it help that so much of the core of this team is back together from that AFC championship game? Does that help as you dive into this uncertain time? Yeah, for sure. Uh, thanks for, uh, for asking, Bob. I hope you're doing well, too. But yeah. The, the off season started uh, with just yesterday. Uh, it's definitely different. Uh, I think it's something we're all getting used to as far as, you know, we're in the middle of meetings and like, you know, somebody's may have a TV on, on, on low or something is causing like static in the background, you know, stuff like that. We're working kinks out uh, as far as the technology, but as far as, you know, us being on the screen, honestly, I think it's kind of fun. Uh, I mean, obviously we can't actually be in the room together, but, you know, we're still cracking jokes and stuff like that. It's almost like we're all in the meeting room. So it, that has been fun. Um, like I said, the fact we are all back together, we're speaking the same language. So it's kind of like we're picking up right where we left off. But and to your second question, I think that's going to be probably one of the biggest factors going into this football season with every team. You know, you have the draft class, you have 
free agents that you sign. You have all these different moving parts. Uh, I think for teams to stay consistent uh, and try to, I guess, bring guys back, I think you're starting to see that a lot in the NFL. Guys are just, you know, bringing guys back on a team that actually know the defense because, you know, we don't, I think a lot of people are kind of playing the season by ear to try to figure out when we're going to start up and things like that. But you want to be able to, once we hit the ground running, you know, it's not a lot of, you know, teaching is more, I mean, of course it's going to be teaching the culture, but more about reviewing. We just hit the ground running and kind of, like you said, left off, uh, start off where we left off last year. We're trying to take this thing to the Super Bowl this time. Jim Watt. KB, good to see you. I appreciate you taking the time for us. Uh, I've got two for you. Uh, one, and I know you kind of touched on it on the question with John, but what, what What's a day in the life of Kevin Byard right now? I know some days are different, but with the quarantine, what what's a day like for you from time you wake up to when you go to bed? Uh, thanks for asking. I hope you're doing well as well. A day in the life for me has been uh, dramatically different uh, because of the quarantine. I think that's for most uh, people in America, honestly, because I think uh, somebody in my position, I'm very routine based, so. I think, you know, my routine has definitely been changed. It's been thrown off a little bit, but I've been able to adjust as time's been going on. So, I mean, I'm, first and foremost, I'm always, me and my wife, we're woken up by our daughter early in the morning, six, seven in the morning. So she gets me up. That's my alarm clock at this point. I don't even need an alarm clock. So I get up, changing her diaper, uh, feeding her different things like that. Uh, making my, I usually probably get my workouts in around, you know, 10 or 11-ish after she uh, finishes her breakfast. Um, and then, you know, as other than that, man, with my wife, being with my family, watching TV, watching videos. Uh, I have uh, different things that I do to try to keep myself occupied as far as like little, I read books, I like word searches on my phone. I'm actually partnering with, uh, with Nutri, uh, I'm sorry, Nutri Trainer. And uh, it's, it's like a virtual reality thing where I'm actually training my mental, where I'm trying to, you know, strengthen my reaction. I was all type of different stuff, but uh. But yeah, man, I was just really just family time, training, family time, training. There's really nothing else to do at this point because, like I said, I'm staying home. Everything's closed down. So just trying to do what I can to be the best uh, family man, be the best husband, be the best father I can be uh, until everything picks up. Uh, I'll focus on that. But right now, I'm just kind of focused on staying in shape and trying to be the best man I can for my family. So I've got a bunch of questions queued up. Uh, I'm going to try to run through, get to everybody before Ryan joins us. But uh, next one up is Buck. Hey, Kevin, hope you're doing well. Uh, you talk about the language uh, that you all speak, that's, that it's easier to have that continuity because of the familiarity with each other. How much harder is that language to teach to a guy like Christian Fulton and, and Chris Jackson, who's coming into your secondary room? Is there any extra emphasis on the vets to kind of help with that process? Or is that mostly for the coaches? To handle? Uh, that's a great question, actually. Uh, I, honestly, I do think it's, it's strong, especially in a time like this, uh, for a guy like me, uh, a guy like Kenny, Malcolm Adore, us as vets, to really uh, making sure that he's able to speak the same. Because the fact that we're all speaking the same language is going to be easy for him to transition because it's not a lot of different voices. So we're all kind of speaking one voice. But uh, it's, I definitely think it's up to us to make sure because around this time, usually you're able to get on the field with a guy, you know, and actually work through those small kinks as far as, you know, communication, pre-snapping and post-snapping, different things like that. So for us to really make sure that we're talking to him and making him feel comfortable as we get to know him so he can start to understand how we speak and how we talk as a defensive group, uh, really both of them, him and Chris Jackson as well. So, but at the same time, I do feel like, you know, by what I heard him, I heard he's a good kid uh, and I'm hoping that he'll be able to transition as fast as possible. But uh you know, I, I think it's good. We have a good group of guys that, uh, you know, that, that care about each other and that care about the success of the group. So I, I don't think it would be any problem with any of us, you know, making sure that this guy, if he has any questions or if he's not getting something, he can easily come to us and we'll be able to talk to him. Thanks, Kevin. Not a problem. Uh, Emily from Channel 2. Hey there. Proud of you for uh, changing diapers, by the way. That's that's impressive. Um <laughs> I, I know that things are kind of different right now, but but looking ahead, you hear things about the season that, you know, maybe it could be delayed. Maybe you're playing in, in front of stadiums. Um, does that weigh on you at all right now? And does it change any part of your preparation at the moment? Um, actually, taking diapersation is that hard. I don't know what's the, the issue behind it. It's pretty easy. But uh, as far as the season, I don't know. I just – all I can do, me, is just handle what I can control and do what I control, which is staying prepared at all times. Um, as far as when the season starts, you know, just kind of playing everything by ear. 
I've had heard a lot of things, like you said, uh, playing without no fans, playing with some fans, fans uh, season getting delayed, taking away the bye week. I don't know. I feel like that type of stuff will cause, you know, kind of gives me a headache. And I don't really get paid to make those decisions. So I kind of just mind the business that pays me. So and I kind of just focus on uh, staying prepared to make sure that when we actually do pick up and play, uh, I'm not one of the guys that has to, you know, work my way into shape or go out there and, ha and have, you know, one of those soft tissue injuries because I haven't been training or I haven't been running or doing things like that. So I'm just trying to control what I can control, you know, until the time comes. And uh, sorry, real quick, Corey Curtis has a question, but can't figure out his, his microphone situation. Um, he said, you know, change is inevitable, but how hard is it to look at the season knowing that Mariota, Laney Walker, uh, Jarrell Casey, and probably Logan Ryan will be there? Yeah, I mean, it's a tough part of the business. It's a reality that I'm starting to see and that I was uh, told when I was a rookie by uh, Denora Cersei. And he was just talking about how I think he was in his sixth or seventh year, which is saying how, you know, as the years go by, you, you get up in years, you start to see how so many guys at the locker room, they kind of interchange and things like that. So, you know, most of the guys that was here when I was a rookie aren't here anymore. Uh, most of the leaders, you know, Jarrell, all the guys that I've, you know, grown to be so close with, Mariota, uh, Wesley Williard, guys that I've learned a lot from as a pro, you know, are moving on. But the way I kind of look at it is almost like a change of the guard a little bit. Uh, I have to use all the things that I've learned from them, from those guys, and, and, and teach it to the younger guys. I think it's just it's one of those each one teach one deals. And eventually, I'll have my day. I feel like everybody's going to have that day. Uh, nobody really knows when it's going to come. I don't think that's something for anybody to think about or you know to kind of you know dwell on. But it's all about you know making sure that you're leaving when when you leave. Uh, you know, you leave a really good imprint on the locker room. And I think everybody that you just named, from Mariota to Marcus to Wesley, where to everybody, I can name a lot of guys. Um, they all left a, a very good imprint on the locker room, Delaney Walker, all those guys. So that's what I want to be, and that's how I want to be remembered when I leave. Uh, Luke? Hey, KB, appreciate you taking the time for us this afternoon. Uh, you mentioned a minute ago the idea that the teams who the virtual stuff will affect the most are the ones that don't take full advantage of what is there. Mm -hmm. What does that look like for someone like you who has, has been in the same scheme for a couple of years now? How do you take full advantage of this? Uh, for me personally, for example, like um, some that can be simple. Uh, I know I've been playing DB for a long time. And as far as being in this defense, I know a lot about the defense. But one way that I'm trying to better my game is – trying to look at things from a coach's perspective a little bit. Like, I want to learn. I want to kind of learn as much as the coaches know. You know what I'm saying? I want to learn about, you know, I want to really dive into the playbook. Because some things, I think, when you first learn how to play a position, you learn how to play defense. You're kind of just trying to learn the plays, memorize those type of deals. Now I'm really trying to study uh, names of route combinations. I'm trying to learn, you know, as much about football as I possibly can. Because uh, I'm not on the field right now. Everything is mental. Everything is just a meeting. So I'm just trying to uh, up my game as far as that and and share the knowledge that I have because I think those type of things will help us on the field. So when if a play, some I see something on the field uh, during the game and I come to the sideline, my coach asks me what I see and I can we can all speak the, exactly the same language. It's not some where I'm saying, oh, I seen this, and the coach he say, you know, he's not really understanding what I'm saying. So I'm just trying to you know just do those type of things to uh, add something to my game. I've got a question from Perez. Uh, he's a writer uh, in Kansas City. Okay. Hey, KB, how you doing? Uh, thanks for doing this, man. I hope all is well with you and yours. Um, hey, I'm interested in asking you about the belief this team has in Ryan Tannehill. You know, obviously the media kind of ran wild with speculating about Tom Brady a few months ago. But uh, as someone who watched everything Ryan did for this team this year, like what was that like for you? And why are you comfortable putting your faith in him going forward? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I already – I mean, it was entertaining at the time, but I kind of already had a sense that, you know, Tennant was going to be our quarterback of the future when the season was over with. Uh, I didn't really think the Tom Brady stuff was really, I think it was kind of just, you know, smoke and mirrors and things like that. But, you know, just watching Tannehill from when I first, you know, met him in the spring of last year, uh, just how he approaches the entire process, the entire year, he handled it uh, probably as good as you, as, as you can think. Uh, just a, a great leader of men. Uh, we go to Bible study all the time, uh, just getting to know him. He's a great person. And one thing that I really feel strongly about him is just the simple fact is that, you know, he doesn't really 
I wouldn't say he does. He just doesn't get too high, doesn't get too low. You know what I'm saying? He had a really great year last year, but he's so humble. You know what I'm saying? I think I can always ride behind a guy like that who doesn't get too high or too low because, you know, when, when you talk about a leader at, the, at, at that position, especially at, at the quarterback position, uh, you know, the team kind of, you know, their energy kind of rides off you. So if you're too high, you're too low, you know, the team kind of flows with you. So it's so that he's very even killed guy. He's been doing it for a long time. He's a great quarterback. He's a winner. Uh, he works very hard. I watch him in the meet room. He's the last guy who leaves the building, first guy in the morning. Uh, everything that you want out of franchise quarterback. So uh, he, he's just a great guy to be around. That's outstanding. Thank you. Uh, Paul Kaharski. Hey, KB, how much did you know uh, Scott Booker in his previous role? What's it like to have a safety coach now? And how are meetings breaking down already in terms of defense, DBs, and corners versus safeties? Yeah, I mean, uh, honestly, I always looked at Book as the safeties coach. Uh, I understand that may not have been his title, uh, but, you know, he's always kind of always, you know, not necessarily being in my corner, but always being in the safeties corner as far as discussing different nuances and stuff. That Combs was also always a part of that, but I think he he always, that was always kind of his role. I guess it may not just been his title or whatever. So, I mean, I'm, I am happy that, you know, like you said, he got the title because, I will say that, you know, it definitely means more for him to be a safety coach because he can really kind of put his stamp behind that because I think he does do a great job with uh, me and Kenny uh, giving us everything we need throughout the week, uh, whether if it's some cut-ups or, you know, some stuff that he may have been watching he want to bring our attention. So uh, I really enjoy watching Book over the past uh, years really improve as a coach. And I think he's going to be, you know, a hell of a coach, uh, you know, for a while, honestly. Uh, Johnny, Franks. Good seeing you, Kevin. Uh, you know, along those same lines about leadership, uh, you know, you've been a true leader moving up and stepping up since year two, not just losing veterans, but really true leaders in that locker room like Jarrell and Delaney. How do you feel like the overall leadership will change and who do you anticipate hopefully filling those roles? Hey, what's going on, John? I, I honestly feel as though, you know, John and Vrabel and even Amy, I don't think they make, you know, decisions like those you know, like letting a guy like Delaney go, like, you know, Trey and Jarrell. I don't think they make those decisions without really feeling strong about the leadership that's that's still in the locker room. So I would say, of course, myself, but, you know, a guy like Derrick Henry, you know, I know people kind of want to talk about, you know, the leadership with him down the stretch of last year, but, you know, he has showed that leadership throughout the entire year. You know what I'm saying? Obviously, you know, he may have not started the year off as fast as he would like to and started the year as he ended it, but I feel like he always, you know, worked hard. He always kept that workers mentality. He always, you know, kept guys alive in the locker room and always, you know, set his two cents when he needed to. Uh, I think I think he's going to be a great leader for us this year, as he always been. Ryan Tannehill. I think Rashawn is really coming into his own as well. Uh, I mean, he's always a grinder, but just, you know, really speaking up and really, you know, showing his energy and really, you know, bringing that passion out every single day. Uh, but we, I think we have guys on, the, on, every, on, every, uh, on every level. And I think a guy like uh, Daquan Jones as well, who really had a great year last year, who's really, um, I think it was kind of underrated and really wasn't talked about as much. But uh, I think he's a good leader on that defensive line as well. So, you know, honestly, I think on all levels and in every room, uh, I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll be pretty good, even with, like you said, the, you know, the leaders and the guys who's been here for a long time, uh, even though they have, you know, they're not here no more. KB, we got about four left. Uh, Chris Harris, go ahead. Hey, KB, good to see you, man. Um, I was just curious about uh, the specific logistics of these virtual meetings. So like you have your position group and I'm, I'm assuming and your coach all on the same Zoom call, then how does the video get, get passed around and how does that work? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's kind of like how we're doing our Zoom right now. Two words though, I mean, obviously, uh, I mean, if you were to have like a meeting room, you know, with the team, obviously you have your coach in front of him. He's talking and he's going over, you know, what we need to go over that day. It's the same thing on the Zoom meeting. Uh, he can obviously put whatever we need to go. Like if we had a, a projector in the room, he could project whatever he need to project onto the screen. And obviously, you know, he's going over whatever we need to go to. So it's kind of the same dynamics. Uh, and obviously if he, you know, anybody needs to interject, we can always interject and ask questions and have different discussions. So. Uh, you know, I think every team is different, though. You know what I'm saying? I, I understand some teams are doing, like, virtual workouts. I'm not sure how all that works. I just think Brabel understands the dynamic as well as, as, you know, as most. And he understands that, you know, he wants everybody to be in that position, means getting over what they need to go over. And uh, obviously he 
probably has meeting with his coaches as well. So I think that's the best way to go about it. You know, I think it'd be frustrating trying to have 50 or 90 guys on one Zoom meeting with a head coach trying to have a team meet. I think that'd be, you know, I don't know how that would work. So, but I think he's, we're, we're handling it as best as we can. Appreciate it. Terry McCormick. KB, if this uh, possibility of the off season being shortened and uh, maybe stretches into camp and preseason, what's a reasonable amount of time that you guys as players would need to get into what they call football shape and be ready for the regular season? Uh, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I think it would definitely, I think when you ask a question like that, you would definitely have to look at, you know, the entire scope, uh, from, I guess you had to look at maybe a guy that's probably been working out every single day up until that point And a guy that may have not been doing anything. So, uh, like I said, I think that's, 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 that's a question that's kind of above me, but me personally, I don't think I would need any time. I mean, I always, me personally, I feel like I just wake up and just play football. I feel like I always try to stay ready. Um, but you know, I understand that, like you said, defense alignment or, you know, guys that, you know, especially offensive alignment that, you know, that hit, that do different things, you know, it's a different type of shape. Uh, football shape is definitely different. Um, would, would we need a month, a week, two weeks? Uh, I don't, I don't, honestly, I, it's, it's not a question I can really answer, honestly, but who knows? It's definitely a, a different football season for real. Uh, Joe Rexford. Kevin, back on uh, Fulton, I know as a film guy, you you like to study stuff. I'm just wondering if you've been able to catch up at all, look at him as a player, um, any sort of, you know, scouting report on him. And then if it does turn out to be, you know, essentially Christian in, in place of Logan, what what's the trade off there? You're obviously losing a veteran, a leader, a guy who does a lot of different things. You're bringing in a young, speedy guy. What's the what's the trade off and the, and the difference, I guess? Yeah, I haven't uh, <coughs> excuse me. I haven't watched a lot of him. I have seen some highlights, you know, here and there on social media. Uh, looks like I say, looks like uh, a really good player. Likes to play in, inside and outside. You know, I've spoken to the coaches about you know how they feel about him. So I mean, they definitely feel highly about him and what he can do and what he can bring to the defense. Um, so I, I I feel good about that. Um, as far as you know, him replacing Logan and different things like that. Uh, listen, Logan was a great player for us for three years last year. He had one of the best uh, years that a DB has probably had in a long time. So to say to replace him, I wouldn't necessarily say they're replacing him, but because uh, I don't think you can necessarily replace that production. As much production, if you look at his stats from last year, I think it's, it's a stretch for anybody to replace that production. But what I think he can bring as a player, so like you said, to be able to cover inside and outside, uh, having him, Adore, Malcolm, uh, it's pretty much pick your matchup. So um, I think that'd be good for all of us as a team. Uh, I think anytime you can have versatile guys that can do both, which I feel like Logan was as well. Uh, but I feel like, you know, like you said, I don't think it's going to be a major job. Because like you said, the fact that he could play inside and outside, Adore could do the same, Malcolm do the same, uh, to be able to match up on number one receivers. Um, you know, it's, it only can help us as a football team. Thanks, man. Bo, David Beauclair, this is the last one. Sure. Okay, you there? Maybe not. So that's a wrap. I appreciate your time, but no problem. Hey, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. I thought. I thought. Sorry. I thought I unmuted. Uh, Kevin, you you mentioned the continuity following Pease's retirement. Is is Mike Vrabel the guy actually running the defensive meetings right now? And uh, and if so, how odd to see him operating in that role? Yeah, I mean, uh, so we're not necessarily uh, doing like we're like you said, we're just kind of just doing position meetings right now. So Vrabel, he's obviously he's doing what he's always gonna do. He's gonna pop it in every single meeting uh, and coach guys up. That's that's what that how he is. He did he did it Dean Pease almost every day. So I mean, it was almost like Dean was defense coordinator and you know Vrabel was like the assistant. You know what I'm saying? But uh, I'm not sure how all that's going to work out as far as going forward and who's going to run the meetings and all that type of stuff. I mean, he obviously hasn't made an announcement. He hasn't told anybody yet. Uh, but for me, knowing Vrabel from even last year, Vrabel's always going to have his imprint on everything that we do with the Tennessee Titans, special teams, defense, or offense. So I know he's going to have a strong uh, influence on, you know, what goes down with the defense. So, But as far as play calling and stuff like that, I, I can't call it. I don't, I'm not sure exactly.